For the next part of our marathon, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Adam Boxer regarding the growing number of active clinical trials that are now focused on FTD. Dr. Adam Boxer is endowed professor in memory and aging in the Department of Neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. He directs UCSF's Neurosciences Clinical Research Unit, as well as the Alzheimer's Disease and FTD Clinical Trials Program at UCSF's Memory and Aging Center. Dr. Boxer's research is focused on developing new treatments and biomarkers for neurodegenerative diseases, particularly those involving the proteins tau and TDP43. He's a principal investigator for the All FTD Network, which we just heard about from Dr. Boschel. And he co-chairs the FTD Treatment Study Group, which is an academic industry collaborative run by AFTD that is working to speed the development of new therapies for FTD. Today, Adam's arguably the global leader in developing FTD clinical trials, and it's a true pleasure to welcome him here with us this morning. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, clinical trials, which and it's a really exciting time for us in FTD research because we really have, for the first time, I think, therapies that seem like they uh, could represent a, a real treatment or potentially even a cure for certain types of FTD. So, uh, let's see. My slides will advance, okay, good. <laughs> um, so, hopefully you can see my next slide. And what I wanted to just tell people about is, um, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into figuring out whether a new treatment works or not. And many of the new treatments that we are developing have come out of laboratories of our scientific colleagues. And they look really promising uh, in the laboratory, but we still don't know whether they're going to help people with FTD or people at risk for FTD. And so we can ask in general, what evidence do we have that a drug works or helps people? And so when we start out, if it's a new treatment, um, we really have no information, and as far as we know, it could make people worse, theoretically, or it could hopefully cure the disease. So how do we weigh the evidence that we get, and how, what kind of evidence do we look at to decide whether a new treatment uh, will work for patients with FTD? Well, probably, you know, some of the worst and least valuable evidence might come from uh, certain characters that we hear uh, not infrequently, and that might even steer us uh, in the wrong direction. But sometimes, and really this comes from patients, uh, we, you know, may see some, someone may see an internet story or hear about a, a, a tea or an herb that's a traditional remedy. I've had patients who've read about things in religious texts and said, you know, is this going to be a cure for FTD? And that might be some evidence, but it's probably not the strongest evidence. Um, we would probably weigh evidence uh, if, if a drug or a treatment is coming from something that makes sense from what we know about the biology of FTD or partic particularly if there's evidence from a, uh, an experiment in um, cell culture or, or test tube models of FTD, we might feel that a drug is even more promising. And we, we feel even that a drug uh, has even better evidence behind it if there has been an animal model that uh, the drug has been tested in. And there are now quite a number of animal models that we can use that seem to uh, produce a disease that look like FTD and we can use to develop new FTD treatments. <clears throat> Sometimes one of these drugs has even been tried in one or two patients and anecdotally we heard it made them better and that might make us really excited to start thinking about you know, whether we should study a drug more. It's important to say though that um, uh, we hear many times about uh, drugs that cure animal models of Alzheimer's disease, uh, some of my, one of my colleagues calls it Alzheimer's disease or FTD, and in fact, we've cured animal models of these diseases hundreds and hundreds of times, but so far, none of these drugs have worked in humans. So still, we don't think that this type of evidence is sufficient to say that a drug works for people. So what we really need are clinical trials, and um, one type, uh, so initially we often do small clinical trials where we're looking for a biological effect in humans, something with humans with something we call a pharmacodynamic effect. 
And when we do that, we have something called proof of concept. And what that means is just that the drug does something in humans biologically that we think is going to be helpful, even if we don't know in the long term whether it's a good drug. And what we really need to do is to do a large clinical trial or a larger randomized clinical trial, which means that people might get placebo or the active drug to, to really understand whether a drug works. And in fact, in the U.S., uh, to get a drug approved for to treat a disease like FTD or, or another disease, typically the U.S. Food and Drug Admi Administration or FDA tells us that we have to do two clinical trials that are large enough that really we can show definitively that a drug makes people better as compared to placebo. So, I, you know, I'm it's important just that we're all on the same page about what we uh, call a clinical trial. So I just want to get some definitions out of the way. So one, so what, what is a clinical trial? Well, <clears throat> the, the definition of a clinical trial is that it's a scientific experiment that tests hypotheses regarding the effects of an intervention. And an intervention, you know, I typically am talking about drugs, but it could be a lifestyle modification a change in people's care management, and the clinic, and this scientific experiment is going on in humans. So we're not talking about animal research. We're not talking about test tube research. A clinical trial is a scientific experiment in humans, and typically we we strictly define results of a clinical trial as either positive, and that means that the the clinical trial confirmed our hypotheses and usually we think about in later stage clinical trials we we hypothesize that the drug works so if the, the clinical trial is positive then the drug worked if the clinical trial is negative then the drug didn't work and Unfortunately, what we often see is that, well, we're not really sure there was a problem with the clinical trial. We couldn't tell for sure. Maybe we, we learned halfway through the trial that the people who we were including were not the right age or they were on another drug that blocked the effects of our treatment that we were testing. And so often we get failed clinical trials where the results are inconclusive and we have to do another clinical trial. So for new drugs, and what I'm going to tell you about today are really exciting new drugs that are developed for people with FTD in most cases. Um, we have to do this in the United States, but there are comparable um, legal requirements in other countries as well, um, uh, where the Food and Drug Administration uh, requires the uh, new drug to be registered, and it's very carefully regulated under something called an investigational new drug uh, application process or an IND. And um, if the clinical trials uh, under that process are clearly positive, like I said, two clinical trials are the classic requirement, then uh, they, there is a label that's written on the package and, and you're allowed to prescribe the drug. Um, one of the things that is uh, really uh, becoming a challenge for many different diseases is that uh, the, the Food and Drug Administration is actually mandated by law. So just like any other part of the federal government, they have to follow the laws that are written by Congress and, and administered by the executive branch. And one of the laws says is that patients have to have a voice in the approval of medications or new treatments. Uh, and so the, the FDA tells us that the clinical trials that we do that show that a drug works have to produce what they call a clinically meaningful benefit. But, you know, that, that can really be open to interpretation. And this is where your voice as patients, as families, as friends of people with FTD is hugely, hugely important. And um, we, you know, the, the people who are reviewing these trials and the government often don't know anything about FTD. And so they may make assumptions, well, this is a meaningful benefit or not. But the only way that they can really know the truth is if all of us, and particularly patients, because that's what the law says, patients and families have to have a voice in the approval, need to tell the FDA. And what we've seen in other diseases, like particularly Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS recently, but also many other diseases, is that um, if patients and families and the community and advocacy groups are very vocal with the FDA and band together and really, really um, clearly tell them that, it, that it's important to approve drugs and that we find certain things to be clinically meaningful, then they have to listen because that's the law. 
But if we're not vocal, if we're timid and we let them tell us what to do, that makes it much harder for us to find treatments. So I can't emphasize enough, and I think Susan may touch on this later, that uh, we really have to be aggressive. We have to advocate for ourselves and for our patients and for their families if we want these drugs to be approved. So um, one of the things that we're doing now is that um, many of the early clinical trials that are coming up in the next year or so are already underway are in genetic forms of FTD that are incredibly rare. And so uh, you heard from Nuper earlier about the All FTD Network. There's a similar network in, in Europe and the UK called GenFi. And we are now forming a global uh, a project called the FTD Prevention Initiative to uh, basically integrate our efforts across the world. So right now the network mainly involves uh, people from North America and Europe, but also in South America, there's a new network forming called RedLat. And we're talking with people, uh, there are people in Australia, New Zealand who are involved now and also in Asia. And so we think that to uh, really uh, put together the most powerful clinical trials, it's going to take a global effort. And this new organization, the FDD Prevention Initiative is what's doing this. So um, here I'm gonna show you some actual hot off the press research results from the FTD Prevention Initiative. And uh, this work was actually supported by the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration. So thanks AFTD, thanks Susan. Um, and what we did here is you can see these very complicated graphs, hopefully, and they have different colors. And these are uh, describing how disease changes over time in people who have the either the chromosome 9 open reading frame mutation, progranulin mutations, or tau mutations. So pink is C9 open reading frame, green progranulin, purple is tau. And at these graphs on the top, you can see the GenFi is the European network and all FTD is the North American network. And what we're using on the y-axis is a measure of, of clinical disease severity. So when someone comes into the clinic, the higher you are on this y-axis, the worse your symptoms are. And on the, the x-axis, we're using a very sophisticated mathematical model to integrate all the data, and this is data from clinical measures, from uh, brain imaging, from other sorts of measurements, to, to gauge where someone is in the course of their disease. And what you can see is that people who have mutations uh, go for many years without symptoms, but right around the onset of their symptoms, they start to, you know, slowly develop symptoms. And then over time, uh, the symptoms over the next, you know, five to 10 years really accelerate quickly. Uh, and it depends, it differs a little bit by what type of mutation you have. And the, each of these little dots and small lines are individual patients who we followed through all FDD or through the European network. And um, what we see is that in, in no matter where you look in the, in the world so far, in Europe or in, in North America, people with these different forms of FDD really behave the same. So this is a really, really important type of uh, uh, insight that we've gained from studying people around the world. And that is that, uh, that um, you know, people tend to progress at the same rate. And if we test a drug, let's say for progranulin, uh, that we could, we could expect to see the same effects in people around the world. So we're really excited about this and this is helping us to do clinical trials. Another thing we've learned from this work is that we now have a new blood test called neurofilament light chain, and it's just a research tool. It's not something that your doctor can order for you, and it's not clear how helpful it would be as a clinical test yet. But in the research, what we can see is that this blood test changes um, uh, when people get sick, you can see the levels go up. But importantly, here's zero here. So zero is when people first have clinical symptoms. And the blood test levels, particularly you can see in progranulin mutation carriers, but in all the mutation carriers are going up before they have symptoms. So this is where they have symptoms, but here they're starting to go up above, above this baseline. And so this is another really exciting advance that suggests we can start to see changes in people before they actually have clinical symptoms. And this gives us the opportunity potentially to intervene with a drug during the stage before people have symptoms to hopefully 
prevent disease. And that's why we call this network the FTD Prevention Initiative, because eventually what we want to do with our clinical trials is to prevent symptoms. So, um, you know, uh, genetic forms of FTD that I just talked about, C9 open reading frame, progranulin, tau mutations, are uh, rare, and they account for less, probably overall, less than 50% of FTD. And we call the other form, the more common form without a clear genetic cause, sporadic FTD. And in all FTD, we are studying both familial or genetic forms of FTD and sporadic FTD. And we think that um, many of the early clinical trials that we're going to do, in fact, you'll hear, are in these genetic forms of FTD because we understand a lot more about them from the, for, for example, from the work that I just showed you. But eventually what we think is that if we find a drug that works in these genetic forms of FTD, it, some of these drugs will also work in sporadic FTD. And even if the exact drug doesn't work, we're going to learn a lot about how sporadic FTD actually operates. And that's from studying the genetic forms of FTD. And that's going to help us to further develop treatments for sporadic FTD. Now, this isn't to say we can't do trials now in sporadic FTD, but some of the most exciting trials that are starting up will be in genetic FTD. And so why do we think we can learn from one form of FTD and apply it to the other? Well, this is uh, some research from our all FTD network, and these are brain scans. And the blue stuff here that you see are regions where there is loss of tissue in genetic forms of behavioral variant FTD. And in the bottom panels here, this is a uh, sporadic form of FTD and, and they look pretty much identical. And so this gives us great confidence that anything we learn from genetic FTD can likely be applied to sporadic FTD. So what's going on now with clinical trials? I said, and Susan said, it's a really exciting time. Well, there's a lot starting up and more to come. So as I mentioned, some of the earliest studies are in genetic FTD. So C9 open reading frame, which is the most common genetic cause of FTD, also calls, causes a Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. And there are new types of drugs called antisense oligonucleotides that are well advanced in ALS but also soon we'll see, uh, uh, hopefully uh, early in 2021, if we're lucky, some trials in FTD. So that's uh, coming. And uh, for progranulin-related FTD, there is now a, a drug uh, that's called an anti-sortillin monoclonal antibody that's in the final stages of testing for progranulin FTD. And another exciting thing is that um, this genetic deficit may be correctable with gene therapy. And we expect that possibly even by the end of this year, there may be new uh, clinical trials and progranulin of gene, ther gene therapy approaches that could correct this genetic deficit in living patients with FTD. Uh, tau mutations are, uh, are another cause of FTD. And while there are currently no trials going on, um, we are actively working with uh, some very exciting drugs to plan clinical trials through this global initiative called the FTD Prevention Initiative. There are also uh, clinical trials going, in, uh, going on in sporadic FTD, so in behavioral variant in uh, FTD and primary progressive aphasia with behavioral problems. Um, uh, there's a, still a trial going on for intranasal oxytocin, which may help with behavior. Um, there's a trial of low-dose lithium. There's a trial of uh, transcranial uh, alternating or direct current stimulation uh, going on. And uh, for people with PPA, there are remote speech therapy trials going on. One is called Communication Bridge. So there really are clinical trials going on, and some of them are incredibly exciting, like gene therapy, because they have the potential to permanently cure a genetic form of FTD. Um, I often get questions, and I think many of us physicians are get contacted by shady people around the world. And unfortunately, there still are charlatans who are trying to say that there are treatments for FTD out there and for other diseases um, that, you know, are, are going to help when they really aren't. And they're really 
um, false and just a money-making effort, and one that many of us have heard about. In fact, I got an email from a company trying to convince me to be part of a clinical trial is for stem cells. And while we think stem cells eventually may be something interesting, the current things that you see for mesenchymal stem cells are actually known by the FDA and by researchers not to be uh, true, real clinical trials because they ask people to pay to be part of a trial. So a real clinical trial that you might want to participate in uh, shouldn't ask you to pay for it. And also they're not done under FDA uh, supervision. So just be careful that if you have a question about a clinical trial for FTD, that if it seems something like this, then it might not be reputable. And with that, I'll, I'll, I think I still have a few minutes to take questions. You do, Adam. That was great. Thanks so much. And again, as I said to uh, Dr. Grossman, who is our first uh, session lead this morning, um, there's so much more to talk about now than we had even five years ago. It's just tremendously exciting and hopeful. Um, I'm wondering, I, I know that uh, to stay informed, a lot of our people go to clinicaltrials.gov and, and there and when they enroll in a study directly, they're going to hear about things called exclusion and inclusion criteria, and I'm wondering if you could just address those terms briefly. Yeah, so um, all clinical trials uh, have these things called inclusion and exclusion criteria, and that means they just define who can actually be in the clinical trial. So, for instance, if we're doing a trial of a progranulin therapy, it, and we can only test the therapy in people who have who have FTD due to progranulin mutations. And so that's an inclusion criteria. And if you don't have a progranulin mutation, you can't participate in that trial because it doesn't make sense. The drug is trying to treat progranulin deficiency. And so that would be an exclusion. And so there's always a list of inclusion and exclusion criteria for any trial. Great. Um, another question. Is there progress in the research into biomarkers or diagnosis that'll make it easier for people to know what pathology underlies their disease? And obviously, especially for people who don't have a uh, genetic mutation. Yeah, so I think one of the things we're really excited about um, is that over the past year, actually just four or five months ago, um, we published a paper uh, in a very prestigious journal called Nature Medicine. Um, of results that of, a, of work that we did through the All FTD network um, of a new blood test called phosphorylated tau, and this blood test is incredibly good for um, diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. So you may be asking, why am I talking about Alzheimer's disease blood tests for FTD? But it turns out that uh, as clinicians, that's often a huge question that many people with FTD are often misdiagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease. And that's a big problem for our clinical trials because we don't want to include uh, people with uh, Alzheimer's disease in our clinical trials, and often many doctors in the community aren't sure whether something's uh, Alzheimer's disease and FTD. So this new blood test, which isn't yet available clinically, but hopefully in a couple of years will be, is very, very good. So it'll be much easier to get an accurate diagnosis of FTD uh, for people. Um, you know, there are different forms of FTD that are caused by different proteins, tau or TDP43, and um, we're working on blood tests and other tests for this. Still don't have anything that, that is really, really good for that, but I think it's coming. Great. Um, the next person says, uh, not everyone in a drug study gets the experimental drug. Can you speak to the role of a placebo and why that's important? And then how do people who get the placebo, how, how are they approached after the study's done? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And I think it's a concern for many people. Um, placebos are very important um, because often the effects of a drug are not clear. Um, it may be something very subtle and yet it may be something subtle but still clinically meaningful. And so if we don't have a placebo, it's hard to know what the effect of the drug really was. Um, sometimes just being in a clinical trial and interacting with all the staff can make people do better. So to really understand whether it's the drug that's helping someone or just being in the clinical trial, um, having a placebo is important. And conversely, sometimes people have side effects 
or what we think are side effects. So sometimes somebody might get nauseous after taking a drug, but unless you have a placebo group, you wouldn't know whether it was really the drug that was causing that, or maybe it's just that that person, you know, had, ate something bad for breakfast. We don't really know. So um, that's really important. But I agree with you that it's, you know, ethically, I feel that it's very important that whenever possible, people who are in the placebo group be able to get the active drug. And so as we put together clinical trials, um, we try to make sure if there's a placebo group that we have something at the end of the trial called an open label extension where people would get the drug uh, if they're in the placebo group. The other thing I'll say is that for some of the very rare genetic forms of FTD, we are able to do clinical trials without a placebo. And that's based on, again, some of the data I showed you earlier with those models of disease progression. We can use those instead of a placebo and ask, well, how did somebody do, uh, how does somebody fit into that model and their disease progression um, if they're given, let's say, a gene therapy for progranulin? And that may allow us to not use a placebo group in certain special cases. Right, right. Um, the next person asks, um, if, the, if a drug is proven successful for genetic FTD in one of these first studies, um, will it have to go through another clinical trial in order to be prescribed for sporadic patients, or would the data from the first trial be sufficient? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, technically, from a legal perspective, it does usually have to go through another clinical trial. But if a drug is approved for, let's say, you know, progranulin-related FTD, and um, people can prescribe it for progranulin FTD, then um, there is, it's possible for a doctor to do something called an off-label prescription. And so they could try it, if it seems like it makes sense to the doctor to do so, they could try it for someone with sporadic FTD without going through another clinical trial. But if someone uh, really wants to officially prescribe it, it would need another clinical trial. Okay, All right. Um. The next person would like to know um, if at this point, are there any medications currently being used to treat FTD? Um, so there, you know, we do know that there are medicines that help with symptoms of FTD. Uh, so uh, things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs are a class of antidepressant that help with behavior in many patients. Um, uh, there are medications, stronger medications called atypical antipsychotics that can kind of uh, damp down very uh, severe symptoms. We don't like to use them, but rarely they can be helpful. So we can treat certain symptoms with approved drugs, but they don't treat the underlying cause of disease. And that's why we're developing these new therapies. Um, we have a question about the International FPI Initiative. Uh, they say your FPI data shows great similarity in the trajectory of the different mutations. Are you learning anything that helps to distinguish the course of the different types of FTD? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I have one minute, but I could talk for hours about that. But okay. yeah, so it turns out that there, there are very important differences, particularly, for instance, between C9 open reading frame and progranulin. Um, progranulin seems to be a very florid and fulminant uh, disease. So you go for many years without any symptoms, and then once you start to have symptoms, they go really quick. For C9 open reading frame, often it's different. The people have a more indolent disease, and there are some people who may have symptoms for years, but may, may not progress very much. Uh, and so that's a very important difference, and we don't understand why, but it, it, it's going to be important to understand that. Still a lot to learn. Um, Adam, I think the last point I just want to stress is, is we've heard from you in this half hour. We heard from Nooper earlier. We heard from the registry team just how important it is for people diagnosed, their family members, the people at genetic risk to work with investigators like yourself. This really needs to be a collaborative effort across everybody um, in the community. Would you agree? Yeah, completely. Yeah, we can't do it without you. And you can see how much progress we've made just with everyone's participation around the world. And we're making great progress. But again, none of this is possible without your participation. I'm exciting. Adam, I want to thank you for taking time early on a Saturday morning from the West Coast. Um, we will be archiving this, this webinar, and it's going to be tremendously helpful for people to understand um, 
the trials that are here, the ones that are coming, and it's such a hopeful time. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you.